evening and welcome to Writers in Conversation and to the ongoing Southampton Arts and Humanities Festival, all from the University of Southampton. We in the English department run Writers in Conversation three times each semester, and we're pleased to again be teaming up with the festival to bring you this event with the award-winning writer Patrice Lawrence and to an online audience. I'm Carol Burns, Head of Creative Writing for the English Department, and I'm so glad to be hosting Writers in Conversation for a second time with Patrice, who was our guest several years ago in 2018. We didn't record that wonderful talk, and it wasn't online, and she's published so many wonderful books since then, so I'm really delighted to have her back. Patrice's debut young adult novel, Orange Boy, won the bookseller Hello, Patrice, by the way. There you are online. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> um, her a debut novel, Orange Boy, won the bookseller YA Prize in the Waterstones Prize for Older Children's Fiction. Her eight subsequent books, including Indigo Donut, Donut have been both critically and commercially, critically acclaimed and commercially successful. And this year she won yet another prize, the JLAC Prizes inaugural children's and young adult category for her book, Eight Pieces of Silva, published last year. Her most recent book was published just in this August, Splinters of Sunshine. But we are asking Patrice to read from and talk about a slightly earlier book from 2019, in part because it's a historical novel set in Southampton in the Tudor period. Diver's Daughter is a book in the Voices series published by Scholastic, which brings to life authentic, unsung stories from the past. In this case, the past is an African diver named Jock Francis. And Patrice has invented a fictional story of a young black girl and her mother who meet him after she saves her daughter by diving into the water. But you are of course welcome to ask her about any of her work. I noticed on Twitter today, that I think it was either a mother or a school teacher who asked about a character in Snap. Patrice was born in Brighton, brought up in an Italian Trinidadian family in Mid-Sussex, and now lives in, in Hastings. She worked for more than 20 years for charities supporting equality and social justice, and published her first novel just in 2016, a statistic I was kind of amazed to see. <laughs> I, I thought you'd been decades of, of writing all these wonderful books. I had, but oh, none of them got published before. <laughs> so I see. <laughs> well, she now has an MBE for her services to children's literature, but en enough from me. Um, Patrice, welcome again to Writers and Conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I think you're going to read from the opening of Diver's Daughter, and then we'll ask a few questions and hear from uh, some of it maybe later in, in the book after that. So, um, but I, I love this opening. So um, I'm really delighted to have you read from it. When I do, when I teach sort of um, deliver writing, uh, creative writing workshops, I always tell people to think about what their fear is. And um, mm -hmm. as you can, when I read this, you can imagine what one of my fears <laughs> is. <laughs> so the first chapter is called The First Dive. I hit the water. No, it hit me. It slapped me in the face, then pulled me under. My head filled with its stink. I tried to hold my breath, but the water's wet fingers were in my nostrils, inching up and up. I couldn't open my mouth to scream. If I did, I'd be dead. But this rate is going to be dead anyway. The River Thames' strong arms yanked me away from the boat, away from my mother, away from my life. Below the surface, the Thames talks to you. It's a stab of beaks as a gulls dive for fish. It's a sound of oars plunging in and out of the heavy water as pilots guide the merchant ships up to the wool quay. As I sank further down, I thought I heard different sounds, proper voices, children's voices like mine. If I could open my eyes, I would sure, I was sure I'd see those children floating on the current, children like me who'd wobbled and fallen. Tell us your story, Eve, they whispered. Tell us your story. So what's my fear there? <laughs> that is, I'll, I'll have you know that um, yesterday um, I read that second paragraph to, to my partner, Paul, because I just thought it was so um, magnificent. 
Um, oh, thank and you. Um, yeah, no, it's really it's and it's a just a wonderful story overall. So, how did you first hear about this diver jock, and and how did you, you know, come up with the story of this young girl and her mother um, around around that historical fact? It was one of those serendipity things, actually. I'd heard that she's seen a background. I have um, Miranda Kaufman's Black Tudors. And oh. I'd actually heard her speak. I've met Miranda before and I'd heard her talking about it. Um, Miranda's a, an academic who's done all the hard work, going through all the files and all the documents, charting the lives of people of mostly, I suppose, African descent who lived during that, that period. Um, and it's, of course, it's one of those works that, you know, challenges the preconceptions that black people only came to the UK in 1948. Yeah. So I'd actually bought the book in hardback for like, you know, 19 or 99 or something. <laughs> and I was very happy to do so. Um, and for my local bookshop. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Tony Bradman, who's a children's writer, a very prolific children's writer, contacted me because he had seen David Olashuga's series on black British history. And actually felt quite angry that it, there was just so much he didn't know because we're not taught anything about this in, in the UK. So he'd contacted Scholastic Books and suggested a series of books for upper primary school inspired by UK black and Asian history. So Bally Ray wrote the first one about, about an Indian soldier in, in Dunkirk. And I was given a choice between Romans or Tudors. Now, as much as I love the Romans, having obviously just spent £17.99 and a half <laughs> Black Tudors, I thought that's going to be my one. Also, my, my mother was brought up in colonial Trinidad, so all the history that she learned is uh, mm. white history, and she absolutely loves that Tudor period. So as soon as she learned to drive, we spent most of our time in a car coming, going from sort of Kent to Sussex to Hampshire to stately home to castles. And I kind of often say there's, there isn't a priest hole I haven't seen in the south of England because <laughs> we went through all of those houses. So there was kind of that in there as well. But I, so I'd read about Jack Francis and there was part of me that, again, there's that slight fury about history we don't know because mm. I remember the Mary Rose being lifted out of Portsmouth Harbour in the early 80s. I was, old, I was a teenager and being slightly disconnected from it. Mm. And again, having no sense that black people had been, you know, in the south of England so many centuries before and had that connection to it. So that kind of drove me to want to, to write that story as well and to bring us back into the Tudor period. I mean, I think the final thing really is that because it's a book that's going into schools, I wanted to write it from a child's point of view. So that's why I wanted to write about a child and a child in poverty and a child whose mother has experienced enslavement and is traumatised by that, but who has this amazing talent to be able to dive deeply. Um, so I kind of all of that mix of things came together and eventually formed the book. And and did you make the mother the diver a diver because of jock and that way she might end up meeting him or was it your fear of water which you suggested um, it was just one of those i think what i i mean a really honest answer is that i think the first uh chapter that but i read i just free wrote because i just thought i don't know where i'm going to start with this and it played in lots of different ways and that one you know i didn't know where jack francis was going to be i really wanted it to start off in london mainly so i could like lurk around the museum of london and look at their models of, of tudor houses <laughs> and then i was like, oh i need to take it out you know and then I was, as i read more actually i found that one of the interesting things that about jack francis that he's the first man of african descent who's recorded as given evidence in a in a sort of british court in an english yeah. court um, and I read that actually in a, in a book in, in sort of Southampton li Library. So a lot of the action with Jack Francis actually took place in Southampton rather than the sort of Mary Rose in Portsmouth. That was kind of almost like a diversion to, to bring it in. So I just thought, I thought it was just interesting, again, that often, you know, the history of black people in England is usually just seen as London. So again, taking it out mm -hmm. to other places. I felt. So the fact that um, like Joan, uh, his mum, is a, is a diver, I think it was almost coincidental because I kind of wrote the scene and then I imagined her diving in to save her daughter as you would, because I can't swim, but I imagine if my daughter fell in, I'd probably be the person who would dive in, yeah. trying to save her and be rescued, had to be rescued. But I just thought her, her mum would instantly dive in. I thought, oh, but what if she can? What if she can dive that deeply? And that sort of gave me the momentum for the story. Wonderful. And the pace of this book is relentless. Um, can you talk about how you go about plotting plotting a novel? 
I'm a bit rubbish at it, and I. <laughs> There's no to... evidence of that, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, uh, well, you know, I mean, I suppose I'm the person who wastes lots of words by writing. I do a lot of free writing because mm. I just I give myself a prompt or get a prompt from somewhere mm. and just write around it, thinking where will it take me. I mean, I knew physically where it would take me, but I'm not very good at visualizing things, so I have to be mm. in a place. So I spend a, a, quite a lot of time in Southampton, just walking around, looking at the medieval walls, touching them, imagine where the sea used to come in and what that would be like, you know, the, the sort of connection to the sort of the Solent to, to the sea. Um, I spent, I've got this book here and I was just looking at it and I just sat in this sort of big library in Southampton, just making loads of notes, things like, um, what were the plants? Well, periwinkle equal joy, honeysuckle equal <laughs> affection and marriage, you know, Eglantine was a symbol of Elizabeth I, because all of these for me can be little prompts and give me ideas. Um, I looked at the water gate and what they know, different gates and the sort of, you know, the, the walls in Southampton and thought what they could be. And then there's a sense of thinking about where do I want the characters to end? So I thought, well, I always think about the end before I think of the, I can get the middle. So where do I want them to be? And I thought, it's a children's book, I want them happy. <laughs> so how do I get them happy? And then I just think of three things with my characters. I think about what is, what is it that they fear, and in this case, it's drowning. You know, what is it they want, and in this case, it's to be out of pov you know out of poverty. And for Eve, what does she desire? Well, actually, what she desires is her mum to be okay and for the family to be happy. Mm -hmm. And I kind of plot towards that, sticking as many challenges and obstacles as I can in the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the um, things I tell my students is that you need to raise the stakes for your character. Yeah, absolutely. And as much pressure as possible. Was that, in a strange way, easier in Tudor England, especially for um, Black characters? I mean, because anybody could have their, apparently, I learned in your novel, their ear nailed to a wall as punishment for being a witch. Um, and, and, and you know, um, a Black character was in, in, a person was in risk of being kidnapped and, and put back into slavery, even in England. Not, not so much in Elizabethan times, so slightly later, because Elizabeth yeah. tried to get the blueprint for, for, for sort of um, for the wholesale cargo of people but didn't quite get it the Portuguese are in there for ages so they had yeah. their faults you know all around sort of um, you know Africa and into South America the the mm. sort of English uh, hadn't quite got there yet they were just a little bit sort of later did a real wholesale sort of cargo but it was still out looking for gold in some ways it could be more egalitarian because I think a lot of it was down to how much money you had and yeah. um yeah. But I think so. I think for me, it was actually the poverty that's the real issue. It's trying to survive mm -hmm. when you have no money. You know, what mm -hmm. do you do? And just reading a lot of the accounts, you know, of how people just, you know, froze to death and people's vulnerabilities, and particularly women with, with sort of children as well. And uh, so for me, that was it. Um, but, you know, there's obviously lots of challenges because I knew nothing about Tudor England other than what I'd seen in uh, sort of mostly on fictional TV right. programs. <laughs> so every detail, you know, what to, particularly is a lot of the, what we see about Tudor England is usually the wealthy. So all these, you know, paintings are often, right. you know, wealthy clothes. And so, you know, what do poor people wear on a feet? If somebody had to get from London to Southampton, how could they travel, you know, if yeah. they had no money? How do they clean their pots? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all of those things, every detail had to be researched. So some of it led to other plot points that was quite handy. Right. But I think I think it's hard to equate the challenges because I think there are, there's so many challenges for yeah, black yeah. people now in today's society. So yeah. it's hard to equate. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing, as well as your lots of plot twists and that relate that um, it's, the pace is relentless. As I said, your scenes move very quickly too. So do you, it sounds like you do a lot of free writing. Do you do a lot of editing then? Do you like kind of really have to work on that conciseness? Um, yes, I think, I think this book is probably, um, probably shorter since one, because you're very, we were very, well, I was very aware that it was something that might go into schools. And I think that was the aim. If we could tie it into, uh, related to the curriculum in some ways and to school learning and primary school learning, then it would be, you know, the take up of it would be much, which would improve, would be really good. And so we'd be sliding the black history in there in lots of different ways, whether it's in English lessons around vocabulary, whether it's around history and a whole sort of range of things. So you kind of want to keep that pace going to keep, you know, young younger people interested and particularly if they're reading maybe chapters in class as well. I think you'd need mm -hmm. to sort of keep it quite sure, I think. I mean, that's not, and for me, it's a learning curve as well, because many of the books I'd written before 
were for older, you know, yes. age groups yes. or with older characters, or I'd write short stories at that age, you know, for, for younger people as well. So it was all for me a learning curve about how to write, you know, an yeah. adventure, I suppose, you know, for for that age. Yeah. Um and your and your language is is was also so vivid. Were you how did you manage that for a younger group? And how do you how do you think about language um, when you're writing? I think, this, yeah, I, don't, I suppose I don't. I just think, you know, there's just so many different ways to tell a story. And part of the joy of being a writer is to to experiment with that. Um, and it's interesting because the, the sort of the books for young adults were harder for me because I wasn't brought up in London. Um, I'm not, you know, and that's a perception usually as a black person that I brought up in London, but I was brought up in Sussex and I didn't move to London until I was in my late twenties and I had to kind of learn London in a sense. Um, and, but because of that, I think it made me a bit more scrupulous, really listening to people and the resonance of their voices and how people tell stories. And this I knew would be a different type of story. And I'd read, um, and because I was such a reader, I think when I was younger as well, as well so I've read these types of books when I was younger so you kind of absorb mm. I suppose the ways that you can tell a story yeah. I think and then you do, like you said you edit it and edit you sort of abandon it for a while <laughs> go back to think right. oh my days you know <laughs> I need to work through it again <laughs> um and then of course you know Scholastic have editors that that can help as well but I, if mm. I can I like to try and I never submit a first draft you know it's usually a sixth right. or seventh draft that I submit because I'd yeah. love to spend the time with editors just polishing and polishing and polishing and polishing I think to make it as good as it could it could possibly be yeah well I'm pleased to say that we have our first question from the audience so um let me see um the question reads you really bring medieval Southampton to life was there anything you discovered in the course of your research that was interesting but didn't get incorporated into the book Oh, masses. I was just looking at the pages and pages <laughs> of stuff. I made pages of notes. I really did. Um, so, yeah, so post-1588 at war with Spain. But all about the Armada and the Spanish couldn't land. <laughs> and, and churches put out Philip of Spain chests to collect money for injured soldiers. I thought that was really interesting. So, like, you know, you know, these sort of early days collecting for soldiers. Um and uh, lots of stuff about pigs roaming Southampton streets that I found really interesting. Um, there was, oh, I made a whole list of professions. I thought, can I squeeze these in here? So like purse yeah. maker. Um, so Margaret Primer made the purse bottom for Elizabeth the first gift of a purse for Southampton. I thought, is there any way I can get that in there? Like, no. <laughs> Peter yeah. Bourne was a glazier and he glazed arms out. <laughs> there was ditch diggers on common land and there's a yeoman of the mail. Oh, what a job, you know. The putrers and oyster draggers. I mean, would you not want to be an oyster dragger? Um, <laughs> so I made all of these notes because I'm actually really geeky and I just find all of this stuff incredibly <laughs> interesting. And I, I don't really know Southampton, so I actually really enjoyed that process of knowing getting to know Southampton through its history mm. and being there and I even stayed overnight in um what would have been I suppose an old uh, coaching inn it said it really didn't look old now but the shape of it was because yeah. I had to work out you stayed at a coaching inn where did the horses horses come in where would the stables uh -huh. be so I stayed and had a gin and cocktail in a, a hotel <laughs> But um, so look, yeah, lots of lots of stuff I learned. Um, I you know went to looked at the old sort of Tudor houses in Southampton, just stood there looking at them and tried to imagine what it would like to be in them and the shape of them. And the, is it St Patrick's Church in the square? I think an old church which has got uh -huh. um, the sort of effigies of of because um, I think obviously I think it presumably went from Catholic to Protestant because it's that, that you know it's that old I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and so looked at that as well, because that would have been around at that time and tried to picture, you know, what the people coming and going to church. And mm -hmm. But yeah, there's pages of stuff. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll recycle and write about oyster draggers. So, sounds like you should. Absolutely. <laughs> so I realized we talked all about the technology in our, like, uh, beforehand, but I forgot to ask to say that I'd want you to read a second section. Do you have a, a section that you... Would like to read from from the book or i'll read it i'll read from the next chapter i think okay, great. Um, so you know so you can get a sense of of what's happened next the second chapter is called a puppet for a penny 
And I suppose with this chapter, again, I sometimes have these little bag of ingredients of things that I want to write about. Mm-hmm. And I really want to write about um, Bartholomew Fair because it's just so oh, renowned. And because I've walked, right. I used to walk past, you know, some, you know, Bart's Hospital and that area around there so many times and catch my sort of 56 bus there. <laughs> I just thought, trying to imagine it, you know, four or 500 years earlier, I think. Mm-hmm. And the fact that the hospital has been on those grounds for so long, I just find really fascinating. So a pop it for a penny. My name is Eve. I'm 12 years old and I'm surprised I've lived that long. I'm a Southwark girl, born and bred, just outside London across the River Thames, but I lived in other places too. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night gasping for breath. In my dreams, the bed linen turns to water, pressing against my eyes, blocking my ears to everything apart from my slamming heart. Then I hear my mother calling me, Mpendwa, are you safe? She calls me Pendwa, her beloved. I surface out of my nightmare into the morning. Three times I've ended up in deep water so far. Twice I nearly drowned. The third time, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll start by telling you about the first time. It was the first day of the Bartholomew Fair. I'd never been to the fair before, even though every year Mama had promised to take me. You know what adults are like. They look you in the eye, make you a promise, then forget it by the time they look away. But Mama isn't like that. She doesn't make promises that she doesn't think she can keep because so many people have broken promises to her. There was a good reason why Mama hadn't kept her promise before. The fair lasts for three days in August and on the first day, every year, I'd wake up, lie still and listen. Every year, I'd hear the same thing, rain. I could hear it dripping into the pots Mama had lined up under the eaves. That is the years when we even had eaves, of course. The August before, we'd had nowhere to sleep and we came close to being arrested as vagabonds. Eventually, we sneaked into a grain store, but we spent the dark hours fighting what must have been the King Rat of Southwark. I knew that we definitely wouldn't be going to the fair that year. The summers when we did have somewhere to live, I'd creep out of bed and check outside to see how bad the rain was, and it would always be the same. Mud and dung oozing across the cobbles, trampled into a slippery mix by the horses' hooves, with little rivers of mud running along the pathways, mixing the muck into a special sticky mess that never wanted to let go of you. Even the dogs looked sideways at it and tried to fa- find a way round it. Mum and I didn't have fancy leather boots or even a pair of clogs to get us through that mess. I just had my old pumps, and no matter how many times Mum had tried to sew it back, the seam kept unravelling, so my toes stuck out the front. By the time I'd walked three steps in that mud, I'd have been barefoot. So that's kind of just setting up the scene before she gets to the fair and nearly drowns her troubles. Right, right. Excellent. This you can tell I did research on shoes, tr- shoes, can't you? Like, I'm getting the shoes in. <laughs> <laughs> that one you got in. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Well, well, that you're reading that section, especially that int- when she introduces herself, le- leads really naturally to um, another question from the audience. And this is from my um, wonderful colleague, Rebecca Smith at the University of Southampton. And Rebecca asks, please, could you tell us a bit about creating your characters' voices and making them sound tutor, but comprehensible for contemporary young readers? And thank you. I made a decision not to make them sound tutor in a sense, because I think... I would end up sounding like a Shakespearean sort of parody, I think. So for me, it was um, a mix of trying to make her sound like a London girl and try to make her also sound like a a sort of a 12 year old and relatable to to sort of younger children because um in, in sort of in primary school but what i was really conscious of, of not having um any is it anachronisms is the word so really thinking about words so i'd find myself thinking like so one uh what did they use the word breakfast then because i'm thinking about what you'd eat in the morning was that a term that was used later would they use the term picnic well no they wouldn't lullaby mm-hmm. so all those words i'd sort of red flag certain words and think about um, whether there were words that existed in, in that period of, of England. But for me, I thought, you know, it, it was very important that she was telling her own story and that the story would feel relatable, but that it would also um, incorporate the world around us. So there's also a lot of thought about how you can, you know, a bit like the shoes, for instance, you know, I wanted to the readers to know early that she was poor and that she lived in Southwark, and that she's really excited about this fair. So a lot of it was how could I explain her circumstances without feeling that I'm dolloping, you know, a great big uh, skip full of, of exposition. Right. 
in it. And that again, you know, it's writing and rewriting and rethinking and trying to, to sort of plan things. But in my forehead, she's a London, she's a South London girl. And uh -huh. I lived in North London and I was snobby about South London girls. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, South London girl. <laughs> well, she also really, um, what, what you also bring out though, in, in addition to this entire world and her circumstances, it's her personality comes flying out of those first pages. Um, did you always know she'd be this very strong? That was, I mean, I think that was really important to me because I think, and it's particularly again, when I write books for young adults, I'm really, I really think about how young young women are presented and about the agency they have over their own lives. So Splinters of Sunshine, like you mentioned earlier, has got a character called Dee who's had a lot of struggles in, in her life and ends up quite vulnerable and selling sort of selling drugs. But for me, it was really important that she didn't come across, in a sense, as a just as a victim and for her to have her own personality. Mm -hmm. So for me, I always start with characters and think about my characters. So maybe that feeds into the question before about it being set in Tudor times. For me, the character comes first. Mm -hmm. You know, who are they? You know, what are their fears? But also I really want them sparky. <laughs> I really want them to try and have agency and sometimes to be a bit sulky and, and to be just yeah. really human. Yeah and to be uh -huh. 12 as well yeah. so for me that is the most important thing particularly when I'm writing young women and particularly writing one young women of color mm -hmm. and I think there is that history particularly of black people being presented in um British history quite often as as, as enslaved people mm -hmm. and we've never been presented as having agency over our lives and our world so again for me I wanted Eve and her mother you know has gone through so much as well I wanted Eve mm -hmm. to have that have a little bit of power <laughs> whenever she yeah. could even if it was just to sulk but she would have some power <laughs> yeah um so as you as you talk about that you're you know people know how important it is for for children to have a kind of role models or see their themselves in 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 fiction um were you like that as a child can you remember a story that you um had or were you looking around in vain for no it just never occurred to me yeah i mean it wasn't even that and that's the thing i think you know people don't understand that it wasn't even thinking about, do I see myself represented? It did not even mm -hmm. occur to me that I could be represented. Mm -hmm. And because the books that I sort of tended to grow up with, you know, there were still some really offensive books around at that time. For instance, that little black Sambo, I think was still around. Mm -hmm. um, and for anybody who's not seen it, it's like a figure, like it's a sort of caricature little African figure with like a bone through his nose. For some reason I had a copy of that and I don't know how, but I remember my mum being so furious that I ended up with a copy of this book. Mm -hmm. Lots of gollywogs around as well um, at that time, and Enid Blyton books and sort of other books. And then I read a lot when I was younger. I was very, I joined, I was fostered from the age of four months to four years by a white working class family in Brighton who taught me to read very young and, you know, and mm -hmm. um, signed me up to the library and really encouraged me to sort of write and be creative. But the books, you know, I was born from the library were like uh, Hugh Lofton's original Dr. Doolittle books, which he illustrated himself. And again, there's a caric caricature of an African prince called Prince Bumpo. And his storyline is that if he gets a princess, he's got to bleach himself white. And I think I probably read that when I was five or six. So mm -hmm. everything I absorbed about black people in books was that we could only be there if we were caricatures. And it was, a, you know, and I didn't even have the word offensive because also growing up again in England in the 70s, a lot of TV was like that. A lot of media was like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a show called a black and white minstrel show on for 20 years where uh, uh, it was on Saturday, BBC One, that sort of um, the tea time show, the big show, which yeah. was white guys in blackface doing jazz hands. And that was on for 20 years. <laughs> so that was actually the way the world was. And you don't, you know, I didn't know any different in terms of that's mm -hmm. what you absorb. So it did not occur to me. And that stuck with me really in terms of my own writing until my 30s that we couldn't be in books and we couldn't write books. So every character yeah. I wrote was white because I just didn't, you know, I was so absorbed and internalized that racism that we were not allowed to be in books. So it took a really, really long time to do that. But the, yeah. the first, sorry, come on, sorry. No, no, you guys. I was just gonna say the first book that did change it for me was one called uh, The Didicoy by Ruma Godden. And it's because I'd made a series about it on BBC called Kizzy about a young girl of gypsy heritage who has to leave her community to go to mainstream school and gets bullied for basically who she is, which in a sense is about racism. And even though I couldn't articulate that, it explained to me why some of my experiences were different from all of my white friends growing up in Sussex. Mm -hmm. So again, there's something so important for me in books about that representation, about how sometimes as a children's writer, such a responsibility on us because we can articulate things that maybe children and young people can't articulate for themselves. 
-hmm. And it's really important, I feel, that when we do that, we, we don't do harm. That if things happen, there are consequences. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's why you're a writer for children? No, that was just an accident. Okay. That doesn't <laughs> yes. sound like it. <laughs> It didn't occur to me. I mean, it's weird because actually I've got two much younger brothers and I always used to write for them and tell them stories and illustrate uh -huh. them. And they still talk, you know, they're sort of, you know, my, 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 I call him my little brother, but he's, you know, a big hulking man in his mid forties. But he still remembers, you know, the stories I used to write for him all right. the time. It's uh -huh. no, it just, it just, <laughs> I, do you know what? I think, uh, strange enough, I thought writing for children would be more difficult than writing for adults, uh -huh. I think. And um, I just, I suppose I loved books so much when I was a child. It just felt, mm -hmm. I've just put them on such a pedestal that I just felt I could never be able to do that. Uh -huh. So, but once I, did, I started writing for sort of young adults, I thought, oh, all right then, maybe I can do this. And then, you know, mm -hmm. I had commissions to write stories for younger age. Um, I, I, you know, got into my stride. Also, when my daughter was younger, I stole a lot of her sort of life as well. And now she's older, I'm thinking like, damn, can't she like age backwards, like Benjamin Button? But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, a question from Sandra from the audience. Can I ask how much time you use from the idea coming until finishing a book? Oh, that's really kind of, kind of hard because I mull over ideas quite a lot, I, I think. And I, they spend yeah. so much time in my head and uh, characters. And what I tend to do is once... Um, so I'll give you an example, not this book. I'll give you an example, for instance, with Indigo Donuts. That's probably the clearest example. When Orange Boy was uh, accepted for publication, I was working full time and it was a sort of two book deal and it was not very much money. So there's no way I was giving up my job um, if I wanted to eat. Um, and I sort of had a, working full time and, and sort of looking after my, my daughter. And I didn't expect a two book deal. So Indigo Donut was only a paragraph. And I think then what I ended up with loads of ideas that I'm modeling in my head. So one was the idea of Indigo as a color. And I just thought, you know, what if she had... Um, this is a young woman and she had siblings all named after colours of the rainbow. So mm -hmm. scarlet, coral, primrose, teal, blue, bell, indigo and violet. But what if she didn't know them? So I do loads of what ifs and I thought, why wouldn't she know them? And maybe they all been in the care system and separated. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, um, it was a time when young people who were in foster care with foster families had to leave their foster families when they were 18. And I was thinking, how could you do that? I could not imagine saying to my daughter, who was very independent when she was 18, you had to leave now. I think that was utter cruelty. So I was angry about that. And then Pix, um, Peaches Geldof, Bob Geldof's daughter died and she died of a heroin overdose and her children were in their sort of home when it happened. And the same thing happened to, to um, Peaches Geldof's mother, Paula Yates. And I remember thinking that no matter how much you try to protect those children, now with social media, everybody has an opinion. So people's lives are sort of dragged around online. But what if a younger woman like uh, Indigo had that same experience, but that she hasn't got a protective factor. So she's followed from school to school and school. So I kind of had all these ingredients and I did lots of mind maps of what if, what if, what if, what if. And then with that book, I did get quite stuck because I couldn't work out what if. So again, I had to go back to the really basics and think, what does Indigo want? Well, actually, She's scared that she's inherited her dad's ang anger. She thinks that her dad killed her mom. She's scared she's inherited her dad's anger. She wants to be loved and to love people. And once I worked that out, I thought, now I can do all the challenges. <laughs> now I can do the work. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to literally go back to that. But with children's publishing, and particularly with the young adults, they kind of want a book a year. So mm. uh, Indigo Donut followed Orange Boy. And then I knew I just couldn't write another book in a year and work full time, it was too exhausting. So Rose um, interrupted, That was I had a one book deal in 18 months. And then I sort of gave up work so I was getting enough sort of additional work. And mm -hmm. so then the next two, uh, Eight Pieces of Silver and Splinter of Sunshine came after a year, but I also wrote other books at the same time and, and short stories. So I'd say kind of like 18 months is around the time, I think 18 months to two years, because I'm usually thinking about the ideas Mm -hmm. long before I actually put anything on paper. Mm -hmm. But at first it was a little bit longer. Uh, Orange Boy was, it was basically, it was an accident because I was at a creative, uh, I was a participant in a creative writing uh, week, uh, crime mm -hmm. writing residential week in, um, in Devon. 
and I sort of wanted to write crime and I love crime books and that still filters through you know all of, of my all mm -hmm. of my books so it's either going to write something set in East London in the 1930s or something set in Trinidad in the 1940s and I ended up on a writing prompt coming up at the beginning of Orange Boy so it's just a writing prompt and I just thought oh like he's 16 and he's at a fairground and oh, he's a girl who really likes way above his league and he's got like an XC tablet in his pocket because it's like crime. And then they come up, goes to training, she's dead. And I just wrote that. And I presumed it was like an adult crime book. I didn't know YA existed yeah. <laughs> until somebody said, oh, you're, you're writing YA. Oh, am I? <laughs> so it was an accident. <laughs> I had to take out some of the swearing. Yeah. yeah. Well, the next question from um, Karis, who's currently doing our MA in creative writing. Um, is um, that she read Indigo Donut um, and music plays a big role in it. And at the back of the book, she says you mentioned that music is important in your writing. So could you talk about that? And did you listen to Tudor music when you wrote <laughs> Lyra's Daughter? And she also <laughs> loves your writing too, by the way. <laughs> I think, you know, I didn't listen to Tudor music. <laughs> I think I wouldn't know what to even listen to. Um, I no, I should have actually, but because I suppose because for me, those two characters wouldn't have had much access to music. I suppose, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. if I was writing wealthier characters, I would have probably would have listened to the music to try and get into the heads of those of those characters. Um, yes, music uh, music really impacts on my emotions a lot. Um, so when I was writing Indigo Donut. I listened to uh, Nick Cave's Into My Arms on loop when at certain scenes and a bit of James Taylor for other things. Um, with Eight Pieces of Silver, actually, um, I created, I wrote a little um, blog with eight songs relating to Spotify yeah. because there's a lot of um, Korean pop in it. And I was really interested, particularly in Korean pop and sort of other popular culture, about how it creates fandoms and how they bring together people from across the world, which I just think is, a, is an amazing thing to do. So for that, you know, the K-pop had that role, but also just wanted to get Bex and her friends trying to do some of the choreography in the kitchen, because good grief, how those young people all jump at the same time, their knees face the same direction, it's, it's a miracle. So I wanted, I just wanted that sense of, and then with Splinters of Sunshine, I actually did um, put something on Twitter, I wanted to do a Spotify playlist that was inspired by Wildflowers. And it was just such a timeline cleanse because obviously there's so many people who have who are impacted by music in different ways. So lots of people suggested things. So the playlist is something like I can't remember if it's like either five or it's something like ninety songs on it anyway, from like Dolly Parton, mm -hmm. you know, lots of bits of country in there, and there's a little Queen song, and a little bit of the Doors, and then there's you know, it's just a, such an amazing playlist as well. It's an Italian, Korean, Japanese, French, you know, Gaelic. Um, it's just it's fantastic, and I think music is one of those things that kind of how you can get if you're at a gig or something and everybody's singing the same song and you're all there. Uh -huh. And and I said, yeah, I actually did buy a book at one point when I was writing Orange Boy because I was interested about how, because Marlon and Orange Boy is really interested in how the brain works. So I was really interested about how music works on the brain as well. Mm -hmm. It obviously works really well on mine. So, <laughs> so yeah, all of the, all, with the Splinter of Sunshine, I only managed to get a little bit of Queen in it at the beginning. <laughs> and then that, was, that was it. Thought, I'm going to get that music in there. But yeah, all of them. And also I think, so the other thing is for music is it creates memories. So for me, I can hear mm -hmm. a certain song. It's a bit like, you know, like Smell Can and think, oh my gosh, I was with that person. or I remember that moment or we were there when I heard that song. So again, it is that kind of like sort of shortcut in, into memory, which I bring mm -hmm. into writing as well. Yeah. Well, um, there is one song in Diver's Daughter where Eve remembers a, a song her mother used to sing. Yes, yeah. yes, actually, memory, absolutely. Yeah. That, and it was actually then, and I was thinking, did the word lullaby exist or not then? And it didn't. Yes. So, so, yes. so, did you research a, 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 that song or did you just have her remember something? I, I didn't research it, no, yeah. I think. I, but once again, that, that music and also about how music gets passed from generation to generation, I think, is that yes. connection, isn't it, as well? So, I did want that for her. But I just didn't know I was going to do it because, you know, um, they wouldn't be listening to that, the sort of the court trumpeters at all playing in the court. So where right. would you get that? But there would have been a cacophony on the streets, I imagine, as well. You know, like Bartholomew's yeah. Fair and all of these things that there would yeah. not be music and musicians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned music and emotion. Our next question from Wan Chen is um, who's also doing our MA is do you unconsciously add your own emotion to your characters as you're writing, or maybe you even, maybe consciously. I mean, is that something that you're- All the time, about? very, very consciously. Yeah, yeah very. Um, 
And I think if you are writing characters and I suppose there's this thing that we want with the characters, we want them to be relatable, but we don't want them to be generic. We want them to be unique. And I think for me to make, from, and it's for me personally to make characters relatable and have some sort of authenticity to them, um, I bring a lot of myself to, to all of the characters. And sometimes, and my, my daughter doesn't read my YA and I'm so grateful because she goes, oh my gosh, that's mine, I know that, I know that. Oh, right. <laughs> and I do, so things like, you know, experiences, you know, positive and negative experiences. So in um, Eight Pieces of Silver, just, I wanted, I wanted to celebrate female friendship. So even now, you know, in my 50s, my female friends are the most, you know, are like family, but less problematic. <laughs> you know, those <laughs> are the people I go to in trouble. We have fantastic times. So I bring that joy of female friendship. Mm. But also, you know, I have lots of experiences of feeling an outsider, both in terms mm. of being visibly, you know, ethnically different growing up, but also in terms of going to London and having a very different growing up experience from many Caribbean Londoners as well. So for us, particularly for writing for young adults, that, that experience of outsidership is really, really, you know, useful. Mm. Um, so I bring a lot of emotion to and a lot of my own experiences into. And I also, you know, I think, you know, even with diverse daughter, you've got a single parent family. So I bring a lot of mm. um, experience of living different you know, family types. I mean, I've, I've never lived in a family where we're all the same colour. I've never lived with my biological dad, um, all of these things. So that shapes very much the families that I write about mm -hmm. as well, because I want to celebrate mm -hmm. different types of family. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's quite conscious, and probably subconscious as well, but that, I'm a bit scared to think what that might reveal about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you alluded um, earlier to um, like not daring to write yourself for a while. Can you can you talk about your path to, to becoming a writer? When did you first, oh, oh you were writing for your, brother it sounds like when you're little I, used to, you I, mean, all I loved writing at school and I was always encouraged by teachers and then when I was at secondary school there were two particular English teachers who Miss Clark then and Mr Jones who really encouraged me and encouraged me to write and send off things to like the Mid-Sussex you know, uh, arts you know festival or stories mm -hmm. so my teachers them um, actually what was lovely was um, when Orange Boy won the prizes both those teachers who were newly qualified teachers when I was at school who are now retiring, both found me on social media and congratulated me and said that Wonderful. they always knew I would do that. But also I could thank them because um, I think Ms. Clark encouraged us to read, I think it was Zed for Zephaniah, and Mr. Jones, uh, Paul Zindel's Pigman. And then I went to uh, Hayward Heath Library and read all the other Paul Zindel's and all the Essie Hinton's. And that must have percolated away in my head for a long time thinking, you know, this is writing about teenagers and felt sort of contemporary at that time because there'd been yeah. nothing like that, certainly in terms of English and British books. And I went on to Tolkien and that pops up a lot in my books as well, like Lord of the Rings yeah. geekiness as well. So yeah, <laughs> do I bring my own emotions like Lord of the Rings geek? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, but I still wrote, and then I wrote short story, a couple of short stories that shape, well, I say shame on me, but were published in, in things like True Romances because I mm -hmm. am so unromantic. So that was interesting. <laughs> Um, but I got paid for them, you know, wrote um, a version of The Wizard of Oz for my sixth form um, that we put on as a play that was like updated of Michael Jackson's thriller. And my claim to fame is that the sound man on that, Matt Osman, was a bass player in the indie band Suede. So, you know. All right. um, so um, I, I sort of wrote, and wrote, I was a real compulsive writer and I've still got boxes, loads of things. And I think for me, and I think... In some ways, I feel a bit sorry for people who are writing now to get published because it feels that like the writing is writing to get published. And I think people feel mm. struggle with some of the setbacks because it is really hard to get published because publishing isn't a meritocracy, isn't about the best story or the best book. It's what somebody in publishing subjectively thinks they could sell. And I, I really feel for people, whereas I think, because I had no expectations of being necessarily being published, but I wrote because I just loved writing and I love stories. So the publishing bit, you know, I would never thought I would be where I am now. It just was not something that would occur to mm -hmm. me. I'm very happy I am, you know, but I never thought that. And then I sort of, when I was 32, um, I had a baby. In, in London and I suddenly thought you know a new millennium there should be lots of books with sort of mixed heritage families mm -hmm. in them and I found none and I walked um I found a book called what about me written by Helen Stevens I think that had a the picture on the front had a little girl uh light brown skin curly hair freckles 
And my baby daughter, who was nine months, used to kiss that picture thinking it was me. And then I think, if you see, if a baby is looking for that recognition, why the hell am I not writing characters like us? But then mm-hmm. also at the same time, when she, when I just had her, I was, turned on the TV and there was um, Mallory Blackman, the adapt, BBC adaptation of Mallory Blackman's Pig Heart Boy. Mm-hmm. So it was an English family, a black family. It wasn't a fresh prince of Bel Air, you know, and it wasn't about gangs or crime. It was about loyalty and love and ethics. And I remember just bursting into tears. So that could have been like post-pregnancy hormones. But, um, <laughs> but it was just literally this door had opened for me thinking, it's absolutely, I have permission to write, inspired, you know, shaped by my own experiences about who I am and the people mm-hmm. I know and not make them white. And it, through that, I think I found my voice. And it still took a while of working out whether I wanted to write film scripts or whatever, but I just wrote anything. I, I've got no shame, I write anything. But it yeah. took until my 30s. And once I found my voice, I still didn't quite know what I wanted to write. But I think that was a shove towards it. It just gave me that confidence because I just thought it doesn't matter if it doesn't get published. That's my voice. Mm-hmm. And is that is that when you did your MA in creative writing? In I did my career? MA with my <laughs> I did my I did my MA in writing for film and TV. So that was when oh, my daughter was one um, oh. and I uh, was working full time. Now I think how you know I remember I was literally <laughs> breastfeeding her, writing a dissertation with the other. <laughs> But I got a distinction because obviously really wanted it. I really, yeah. but I think for that it really taught me things about arcs of stories, but also my love of listening to the resonances of people's mm-hmm. voices and about how people tell stories in different ways and how you can use that in in writing. And I think that's why I really love writing contemporary YA because you can just really play with voice in that, which is real my mm-hmm. real joy. Yeah, but then um, as I mentioned when I when I notice the detail that your um, Orange Boy was published in 2016. It's only 2021. You just feel like you've been, you know, important on the scene for like, you know, 10 or 15 years. So how how long between before Orange Boy kind of came about and, and then you had your, your, your first novel published? How, 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 what was that path like? Um, well, I'd had an agent for quite a few years before, and I think I was really lucky that I got an agent at a time before you had to write a full book. Because I wonder now, but how do people do this? How do they do that? <laughs> and I met Caroline at an event. It was um, British Book Awards. So I'd had a short story published in an anthology, which had been targeting um, Black and Asian writers. Mm-hmm. So it was like a um, partnership between the Arts Council and Hamish Hamilton, who published uh, Bernadine Evaristo. And I think we're part yeah. of, of sort of Penguin now. And they would publish the anthology. So I had a short story which I'd written, kind of slightly plagiar, not plagiarizing, but it was a story that my daughter's uh, dad had told me. He was white, working class, grew up in Hackney. And our lives were just like negatives of each other, so very different. And I just loved that story. And it was a story, it's a teenage story. So I wrote it as a sort of teenage story. So in this book of, you know, Black and Asian writers, I write a story about a white boy, typical. <laughs> but um, I think kind of what it showed was that, you know, I could just get into voice when I heard it, when I heard it. And I got invited to an event at the um, Arts Council, their table at the British Book Awards. But I think it's because literally somebody pulled out. They only asked me a day before. So I just thought, it's free supper. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. And then I finished work, changed in the lose when I got there, just realised I knew nobody at all, just <laughs> nobody. And I just stood at the top of the stairs, like drinking Prosecco very hastily, thinking <laughs> I know nobody. Then I saw John Agard, who recently got the Lifetime Achievement Award from Book Trust and Grace Nichols. And I'd met them before, nothing to do with writing. So I'm like, I'm going to weave my Prosecco we self down and say hello. <laughs> and Caroline is John's agent. So I chatted to her. She got a copy of the anthology. I pitched an idea to her and she took me on many oh years God. later and many books written that still remain <laughs> in a drawer. Huh. Um, but she was just very patient. I wrote about five or six books before one got published. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really took time. And that's just, I couldn't write books. I had ideas. Um, I had characters, but I really struggled. So the first couple of books that were published were education, part of educational writing um, schemes, um, reading schemes, they're called. Um, so one was Granny Ting Ting, inspired by my auntie in Trinidad, which has actually now been reprinted by Bloomsbury. So like Bloomsbury oh, game there. You know? And another one was for Pearson, and that was again, uh, um, inspired by, by Trinidad as well. But even those small books took me taught me how to write 
a book for a certain readership, taught mm-hmm. me how to work with editors and the difference in working with different types of editors as well and how to create a cohesive arc and the amount of editing that I would need to do to try and bring mm-hmm. the story to life. So even that, you know, that really taught me the sort of bones of how to really think about writing books. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. I was part of a writing group for, for a very long time as well. And I think without them, I wouldn't have got published. Mm-hmm. So they really helped me take out some really dodgy subplots from Orange Boy. Um, mm-hmm. Jenny Downham, who's an amazing writer for young adults, mentored me through that first process as well and was like an early reader and gave me kind of lots of advice. Um, so I had lots of help coming in for that as well to help me shape mm-hmm. that 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 book and each book you learn I still learn every single book I write about what mm-hmm. I could do better what I could do differently or what I could explore in a different way and I love I love that process mm-hmm. yeah um just to encourage the audience to keep sending questions um we have one from earlier though from again my colleague Rebecca Smith did you use maps in um Dyra's daughter or did you draw your own map no, I didn't draw my map, but I spent a really lot of time online looking at Elizabethan uh, maps mm-hmm. of uh, Southampton, especially, and of, of Southwark, a really, really long time. Um, particularly, and I liked doing it when I was actually in Southampton Library, there's something about sitting in that library, looking at those maps as well. And then I'd walk around a city and try and picture it, and I'd bring it up on my phone. <laughs> and because you still have those medieval walls in Southampton, you know, I was trying to equate, oh, that ruin is, that's a Biddle Gate, and that would have been a yeah. water gate, and sort of imagining the ways that the water came in and where the houses would be and the gates as I walked through the gates you know at the the end of the road and you know the giants and stuff so I used yeah I did and also in um I love looking at old maps of London there's actually one behind me now as well which is like uh which is more from the um, 18th century as well for something I'm writing at the moment and I was just so fascinated about how some places still keep their names through all those centuries as well and where there are fields and what's there now but um, and also, you know, simply I need to know how long it's going to take somebody to get to somewhere and where the river is, because obviously it got, uh-huh. you know, got um, narrow during sort of the, the Victorian times of the sewers and um, and also how London Bridge would have looked and the boats going through it and the uh, Portsmouth Harbour as well, what that would have looked like at that time. Mm-hmm. And I went and walked around and the harbour's really big, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought it would be more or less like the same size, you know, and think about how the Solent flowed out and the currents. So, yeah, I, I do, do I need to look at maps because I, I'm not really great with like a visuals and spatial awareness. So I need to literally walk my fingers along it to have a get. But I still find it really exciting seeing layers yeah. of maps and that sort of, um, it's almost like psychogeography, isn't it? You know, the sort yeah. of layers of social history and, you know, what happened in those different places. Well, I hope you wrote... Um, wore the right kind of shoes, right? Like the, the Tudor shoes. Did you put, put those no, on? No, no, no. I wore the ends. I thought it was a bit safer. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, I know before you um, quit your job, you were working for more than 20 years at, um, oh, where have my notes gone here, for charity supporting equality and social justice. So how did that inform your writing? Did it Everything make about, writing yeah. Writing yeah everything I mean some some of it is I mean there's some surprise things in there for instance that like one of the jobs I did I worked for for Brooke which support young people in um uh sexual health so mm-hmm. I worked um as a centre manager so I spent a lot of time like handing out condoms and they taught me a lot about sort of contraception and and sort of, when I sort of wrote a scene, scene in Indigo at the end when I wrote this original love scene and I remember my um reading group saying Mm, that Bailey isn't wearing a condom and I said oh but then I just thought well actually how can I expect a young woman to ask for that if I can't write it so I'm sort of very aware of sort of young people and and sort of that's that's and also Rose Interrupted is very much about the sort of sexual pressure on young people both sort of male and, and female I've worked with families that have gone through child protection so that idea about you know and also families, um, organisations that's work with the families of prisoners, you know, I've been in prisons, done work in prisons. So I write a lot about prisons as well and about that kind of gap between the rhetoric of politicians about prisons being at like this holiday camp and all of, when actually prisons are anything but that right. indeed. So, you know, that again, I feel was quite important. Because my own biological father was in prison for a month as well for forging a cheque, which meant that when he came out he couldn't be a nurse anymore and he lost his house and he had a breakdown and sort of ended up homeless and died when he was younger than I am in his in the 40s I feel quite strongly about those misrepresented stories and also about 
marginalized people who don't whose stories um it's not that they don't tell their stories they're just not listened to and i think again i think as a role uh, you know for me i feel that's we can change we can change little bits of the world or little bits of opinion with narratives and stories sometimes mm -hmm. and if you can just change a little bit of that you know hopefully through some of the stories that i can write I mean, one of the ones that I've recently rat, which is for OUP and uh, Barrington Stoke about a boy called Al whose mum's been in prison and it's a bit about food poverty. You know, there's one teacher I think has bought 200 copies of that for, for his school and it can provoke conversations about angry children <laughs> and what, why they're angry and about, you know, what happens when you slip through the net as well. So I think, you know, coming, you know, from a relatively cosy commuter town in Sussex, but always knowing because of my own background that there are other stories then you come to London where there are just so many stories and you work in this sort of charity sector where you hear those stories, you know, it's hard not to feel passionate about making those stories known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll probably um, stop in a few minutes. So um, just to have uh, one more, um, you know, just to encourage people to send in questions again. Oh, we have a comment from Sarah. I have to go, but thank you so much, Patrice and Carol. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, oh, what, so, um, you must speak to young people a lot in, you know, in now that you're a writer, and I get the impression that you do um, events in schools and 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 whatnot. Yeah. Um, what do you learn from from those events? <laughs> that year tens never ask questions, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it was interesting, I think in 2019, weirdly enough, I sort of did a lot, you know, I did events, I think, in the Hong Kong Readers Festival, so in schools in Hong Kong, I've done, you know, schools over, you know, in young people in Wales, Scotland, you know, England, lots of places, Italy is, as well, because there's been Italian translations of um, Orange Boy now, sort of Rose Interrupted. And I mean, I suppose I just, I'm just so in awe of young people anyway, I think, and mm -hmm. always have been, I just think, you know, the world that they're growing up in is, is, isn't the world as it should be, even pre-pandemic, I just think. And if you look at all the things that are happening now around climate change and just, you know, what's happening in, in terms of, um, you know, poverty and food poverty, it should not be happening. And I just think we as a generation have let them down a little bit. But they have so much, you know, the, the young people that I meet are just so open-minded and, and sort of tolerant and questioning and sort of passionate about things and you know when I feel a bit you know down I just think you know I shouldn't be because actually you know we've got this amazing generation of young people who are having conversations that I could not dream of having when I was 15 or 16 around different people's identities and what that means and it's just you know just so proud of them really mm. and I mean I also learned you know about the importance of books to them and of representation because I would have young people and I talk very openly when I do school events about being fostered and about my dad being in prison. And, and you know, so you'd have a young person who goes, geez, I was fostered. Or, you know, yeah. yeah, my dad's in prison. And we'd have that conversation. And it's not only the representation in books, but someone like me can say, actually, <laughs> you know, these experiences have happened to me. And this is the adult I am. And this is what I do with all of these things. I put them in stories. Um, so, yeah, I meet sort of young people and I particularly you know, enjoy meeting young people who are the young people who may think that they their experiences aren't represented in books. I think because it, it may, it, it's a way of saying that you are important too. Mm -hmm. And particularly because the curriculum is still the curriculum, the English curriculum is a curriculum that I did. You know, and I didn't even do GCSEs, I did O-levels. It is still the same. It's shameful. You know, we're not preparing young people for a global society. We're still preparing them to believe that England is a be all and end all, particularly dead white guys. And, you know, and literature and writing is so many other things. Um, so when you get young people who are into spoken word or young people creating their own graphic art or graphic magazines, and even young people doing cosplay and using their creativity for that, I just think they're amazing, really amazing. Yeah. Do you think, um, how do you think white writers should deal with this question of representation and, um, you know, in, in their fiction? Because it can sometimes be a tricky thing for um, white writers. They feel like, you know, they 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 can be criticised sometimes. I'm just wondering what. How do you think? What do you think their role is? Is it awful to say that I don't care? Um, I just think the reason is because I think it's nobody at all is entitled to be published. 
ever. And I think sometimes there's a degree of entitlement and some writers say like, oh, I'm not allowed to write this character. And I just think, you know, people of colour have been writing about people of colour for so long that they, you know, and haven't been published. And I think it's such a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. I think because publishing again is predominantly white, it sometimes feel it's easier to see people, counts of colour filtered through white writers' eyes than it is through, through, through writers of colour. And because maybe there are many, you know, publishers who don't necessarily get those little points of reference that writers of colour might put in for other people of colour who might be reading their books. So, you know, there's a real issue. And I think, you know, a lot of the white writers who talk about being cancelled, you think about Lionel Shriver or Pullman mm. or the others, you know, they're not, you know, Lionel Shriver pops up at every literary festival, she still gets to write big columns. You know, Philip Pullman has like his name in, you know, under these shelves in, in, in bookshops. And I just think, you know, white writers can write what they want, but if they're writing something that, again, going back to children that causes harm, then I think, you know, they need to listen about why that happens because we as writers should not cause harm to children. We really shouldn't. Um, yeah, I, you know, I see it all the time, all my publishers think I shouldn't. Just get over yourself. Really? And it was interesting. I was doing a, a co tutor with, with the writer Melvin Burgess, who basically kind of kick started the sort of YA that I write when he wrote Junk. And we were co tutoring him in Scotland last week. And he talked about his friend Peter Callow, who's a black writer. And they, three of them, have created a sort of their own universe and have each written stories setting that. Uh, Melvin's characters is, is mixed race. And he said he didn't intend to write a mixed race character, but first Peter Callow said, oh, please don't write any white saviors. And then sort of Peter Callow went through with him, even things like, she's a black girl, she probably won't flick her hair because her hair's not flicky, you know, and little details. And then sort of Melvin said, you know, he said to Pete, you know, well, we get worried, you know, that if we do the things wrong, that we'll be called racist. And Pete said, so what do you think black people have been called? <laughs> you know, the names that we have been called yeah. on the street, in the media. Again, you know, it's, I honestly, they're going to do what they're going to do. Publishers are going to publish. And some white writers do amazing stuff. You know, I love, um, uh, is it Bridget Blankley? This is it Spirits and Jamal, I think is an amazing book, fantastic book. I love um, William Sutcliffe's Concentrate, which I think is absolutely amazing. Um, but also if you think again, like uh, as DeSalle's Boy Everywhere, which is about a Syrian refugee boy, as isn't a Syrian refugee, um, but she really, all the people who write books about others that aren't like them that really resonate with people who really care who really do it not because it's an academic exercise or just you know because they think they should it's actually really care and that shows in the writing and I think if a white writer isn't prepared to discuss issues like racism or other is you know being othered or those difficulties then I just think why are you writing that character is it just simply because that's what publishing thinks you know diversity is so it's you know i you know, white writers have dominated writing, so I've, I, I need to find a headspace to care, actually. Yeah. It's so harsh, I, I, but, you know, it's, you know. No, I, I, I didn't mean my question to be... Um, no, no, it's not, but, I mean, it's, it's the first time, of, um, like, I think, yeah. when Orange Boy came out, I think it was Anthony Horowitz, there was an um, interview with him in the BBC saying, oh, my editor has, as you know, said I'm not allowed to write black characters, and he was a little bit cheesed off about it. And I was just thinking, you know, you've kind of got this writing empire. You've You've done so much. It's honestly, you haven't got an entitlement to write a black character if you're not going to do it well. Why would you want to do that? You've already got all of this. You know, we have to have some of our stories as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, another thank you and um, from Rebecca Smith as well. And can, can you just end with um, any advice you would give to writers at, at the beginning? Oh, I, I, I also want to... Um, have a call out to Bridget Blankley. She's a, one of our PhD students at Southampton. So it's nice. It's so lovely to hear her book is beautiful. So um, it is. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. It. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But any uh, advice you'd give to people at the beginning of their writer career or, or, or any stage, I suppose, but especially people just now, maybe just now beginning to think seriously about being a writer? I mean, I think. One, I just think write for the joy of it and see where it takes you. I think so I think we we sometimes, again, I think that's been quite liberating for me because I didn't have that YA in mind or whatever. I think I just wrote. And I think people, you know, do try to write for the market, but actually we don't actually know what the market is. I've just read a fantastic proof of a YA book. I think it's called The Cats We Meet on the Way 
by, oh, and I can't remember her name. Is it Nadia Mikhail? It's published by Guppy Books and uh -huh. it comes out next year. So Guppy had a competition for, I think it's YA writing and mm -hmm. this one, and it's set in Malaysia. And it's, um, I mean, the sort of context is that an asteroid is going to land on the earth in, in uh, I don't know, four months or something. And scientists knew about it for four years and did nothing. But that's not what really it's about. This is about a girl and her mum and a girl's boyfriend and her family who drive a camper van. And it was an ugly cat as well who actually creeps onto the van to go and find this girl's estranged sister. So it's kind of about little kindnesses and it's about family and it's about... Mm -hmm rethinking the past and, and re, what what would you do if the end of the world was nigh? But it's not an apocalyptic thing because it's actually much more micro than that. And that's like nothing on the market. You know, it absolutely isn't. It's a really sort of gorgeous, you know, thoughtful book that I just like read in one sitting when I was actually not intended to read anything. I should have been doing something else. So I just think, you know, when you're writing, just be brave. Write about the things that you really care about because... You know, if your book does get published, you're going to be sitting with that book for so long, writing so many drafts of it, talking mm -hmm. about it for an eternity. But write about, you know, and the things that you write can be personal because nobody's reading your notebooks and your iPad at the moment. So, you know, let it all go out on there. And then afterwards, use that and put that in and shape it and trim it and make it into something that is uniquely you. So don't, you know, what makes a book special is when it comes from you. You know, because we could read lots of generic title books, but that one, like this one, um, the cats that we meet on the way, it's like, oh my days, you know, I've not read anything like that. And it is, and that Bridget's book as well, I've not read anything like that. So be brave and make that book, you know, part of you. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Um, Patrice, it's just been wonderful to talk to you again. Um, at and to you. Conversation. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Hopefully we'll meet in person next year or sometime. Yes, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so um, thank you all for for listening um, and, and being here and asking such great questions tonight as well. So um, there's some, some closing slides that the festival likes to um, have me talk about. So it's really helpful to us if you could spend a couple of minutes letting us know how tonight's event was. Um, that helps us shape future digital events as well. And there's a URL there, um, very complicated, starting with bit.ly that um, you can be able to click on for us. Um, this event, as I mentioned, is part of the Southampton Arts and Humanities Festival. It goes on until the 20th of November and um, the end of this week. So please take a look, see what else is going on. And on Saturday, there's still a few events left for Hands-On Humanities Day. Um, and you can follow us on the social media. Um, there's the hashtag UOS Arts Hum Fest. Um, and um, I, I hope all of you um, are able to do. I want to have a few thank yous for um, Sylvia from Published Engagement Group and um, for Aisha Jahan, our um, a, a colleague of mine who also helps in the background, and Rebecca Smith, my wonderful colleague who is in the audience today. And finally, again, to Patrice. Thank you so much. Bye.